do have this recorded for the lovely folks um, on the internets and the webs who would just couldn't make it to our virtual meeting today. Uh, we have some awesome uh, speakers today, some members, actually all members uh, uh, from the Hacker Dojo, the nonprofit organization, your favorite nonprofit out in Silicon Valley. And when we reopen, we'll be uh, love to have all of you come in and stop by and say hi. Um, so right now, what we're going to do is, uh, wait, hold on one second. I see the format is um, change layout. Let's do spotlight auto. Let's try that. Or no, let's do a pin. How about that? Cool. All right. So now, at least in the recording, you see my weird background and, and uh, myself as I'm talking instead of floating icons and avatars. So yeah, definitely stop by the Hacker Dojo. Uh, when you have a chance, when we do open up, we're, when we're opening up, we could open that up for discussion, but it looks like 2021 uh, based on Santa Clara County um, uh, safety uh, recommended uh, colored tier chart that they have available now. You can check it out online. Um, but for now, we have our virtual community, active community, uh, and we have an awesome lineup of speakers today. Thank you for joining. Uh, so the first person up and um, Mike, I just want to make sure you can definitely send a chat in if, if you need a little bit of time to, to uh, set up. Uh, but for the first person we have on the chat, and I will send the pin right over to the, uh, to Mike, Mike Bowles. Um, Mike Bowles, marketing, uh, uh, I mean, not marketing consultant, machine learning consultant. Uh, and he will talk a little bit about uh, his background, um, you know, his participation in Dojo, and then he'll go right into his, his presentation. Uh, Mike, are you there? Yep, the floor is yours. Thank you. I would. I was planning to just um, uh, talk off the top of my head, if that's all right. Oh, of course. Right. And um, and will also allow me to ask you, like, what would you like for me to talk about? I think I put down, uh, you know, kind of machine learning and yeah, yeah. So I could I could talk about those things in particular, but I'm I'm happy to you know take requests. So whatever you're, whatever everybody, whatever everybody's interested in is fine. I've been a Hacker Dojo member since like a long time ago. I think I joined the Hacker Dojo when it was over in the original building. And um, the, um, the occasion was that um, I was, I was um, uh, uh, one of the volunteers with the, uh, the ACM and uh, the SF Bay ACM group. And we decided we were gonna do a hackathon <clears throat> and we couldn't figure, you know, we tried like church basements and all different kinds of stuff. We couldn't figure out where to put it. And, um, and we, uh, you know, we stumbled onto a hacker dojo and, um, and, and, and put it on over there. We had to like go, you know, get somebody's church to donate just the chairs and <laughs> bring them all over and, uh, you know, litter the, litter the place with, uh, with uh, folding church chairs. And, uh, and I remember the, like a picture taken from the, you remember that room that was in the back, you know, that was kind of all the way back, was kind of the large one up there. And it, it had a, like a stairway in the back where you could go up to another level and stuff. And when you stood at the front and took a picture, it was like people were like, like packed together. This would never happen now, right? Like meetings are just no fun. Everybody's so far away. Anyway, the, um, the uh, people were just packed together and all the way up the stairs and lining the, uh, lining the, um, uh, the hand railing up at, at, up at the top of the stairs. Anyway, that was the uh, the first, um, uh, what do we call that? It was a, um, a, a machine learning kind of a, 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 um, a, a hack meeting, you know, you the uh, no, a machine learning camp, I think we called it, because the, uh, the, what people did was they wrote down what they were interested in on a sheet of paper, and then we tried to like form groups out of it and, uh, you know, make discussion groups and send people off like that. That's uh, that's still going on. Uh, but they um, uh, with the, S, the ACM that that event has grown to, you know, require like a huge venue now. The um, the um, but that was kind of when I got to know the Hacker Dojo and came over and uh, and, uh, you know, took a membership and started hanging out and eventually started doing uh, machine learning classes there, which I did for quite a while. And um, and nowadays I was I was working there, uh, you know, as kind of a uh, uh, an office for myself. Um, while um, you know, until we all stopped, <laughs> we all stopped working there. Um, so the so and and that is in a way the uh, you know kind of the story of uh, of uh, uh, me getting into 
machine learning was actually teaching the classes over at, teaching the classes over at Hacker Dojo. I've always found that when you want to, you want to learn something, teaching it is the best way. <laughs> so, uh, so I kind of experimented on the. Uh, pardon me. I hope I hope you, <laughs> I hope you got. Yeah, I hope everybody got something out of it. Um, and, and since then, I've kind of uh, started doing um, uh, machine learning and a, a variety of different types of, of problems. Um, one of the ones that I'm real excited about now is um, is uh, using machine learning for uh, drug discovery. <coughs> and um, uh, what we're finding is that it's um, that we can we can build a uh, we can build a neural net that will take um, that will take uh, molecules, drug molecules, as input, and um, and then we'll we'll reduce the drug molecules to some kind of a Euclidean object. This is called this is what's called representation learning. So it takes the drug molecule and reduces it to a a Euclidean object, and then can can train that Euclidean object to predict properties of the drugs and it can do chemical properties like solubility and pH and things like that but it can also do more complicated things like protein binding and uh, and uh, reactions with specific disease types and so forth and then and then once we once we've found a a, um, a, a, a so it, and 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 so and then so so it can do that with these representations it can take the representation and do predictions it can also take the representation and convert it back to a molecule, and so and so like this Euclidean object is uh, rich enough in content that it can be reversed to turn back into a back into a molecule, which means that kind of end to end, we've got we start with a we start with well we take a whole pile of drugs actually, and and train this it's called an encoder decoder pair because we take the drug molecule and code it into a Euclidean object and then take the Euclidean object and turn it back into a turn it back into a drug molecule. And so we take it takes a lot of data, but we take a lot of data and they and the, the data are, you know, starts off with um, uh, drug molecules. And so, you know, they're uh, uh, databases that have got thousands of these things. So we train that encoder decoder pair so that it can do that conversion. And then, and then once we've got that done, then we can then we set the decoder aside for a while, and we start looking at this Euclidean object that we've got in the middle, and start using that to predict properties for some of the drugs that we've got in the catalog. And so that's how we build up a that's how we build up a library of um, uh, you know to build up the capability to make predictions on these representations. And so now, and after we've done that, then what we've got is we've got this thing where we can we can put a molecule in the in the in the beginning, and that'll get mapped to a point in a Euclidean space, and then we can take that point Euclidean space and we can we can predict its properties, and we can say to ourselves, I wonder if we moved around a little bit in this Euclidean space now, maybe close to the where we started. Let's see if we can get an improvement in the properties of the of the drug. So we kind of move around until we find a until we find another point that it, that that works better than the one that we started with. And in some cases, we don't want to move too far away because the the drug that we started with is say that's one that's easy to manufacture. But we but we do this optimization, and after we've done the optimization, then we've got another point in the Euclidean space. But now we've got this decoder that we can turn to to take that point in Euclidean space and turn that into a molecule, and so we we use that to to do drug design. And it's not you know it's not the it's not the final answer, but but it's a it's a good starting point. And uh, you know particularly with us having some control over the the um, the you know like the starting point for the for the optimization, we get drugs that are manufacturable and. And to some extent, some of the, the properties are known with regard to, you know, are they going to be harmful and things like that. And so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm jazzed up about that because it's like, it's really, it's really, uh, it's really cool neural networks, which is, uh, which is uh, kind of the fun part for me. And, uh, and uh, this, uh, the, uh, the work, 
uh, the work that, we're, that I'm doing now is a part of a, a phase two grant that uh, some friends of mine got. I worked with them on the phase one grant and on the proposal for the phase two grant. And now the uh, now the phase the phase two grant just came out a couple of months ago, and so I've started working on that. Anyway, so that's something that's something I'm, uh, I'm uh, you know happily engaged with. Um, that's all. I'll stop talking, I guess, and uh, let people ask questions. And you can either right. you know. So my quick question: So how does the um, in in the testing part uh, when you're when you're running simulations? How do you what what's the ground truth that what's the optim like how does it optimize how do you optimize like what is it just a known out what is it are you basing it on certain outputs or simulated outputs yeah um, we so so the optimization is going on is 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 in this Euclidean space where we've got you know all the the drugs are represented by by points in a Euclidean space so mm -hmm. so we have to search around that space. And what we're using to it to evaluate it is is um, how is is models that we've built of how the the points in this Euclidean space map to various drug properties, mm -hmm. and and that was there was it's kind of a a two part training thing because the as I said the the first thing we have to do is train the the encoder decoder pair. Got and it. then after we've got that done, then we kind of set the decoder aside for a moment, mm -hmm. and we start putting in drugs on the uh, you know as input. And now instead of converting it back to a, to a molecule, but yep. converting it back to a drug molecule, we we build some other neural nets that are looking at the Euclidean output, uh, the Euclidean object, mm -hmm. and they're trying to predict the properties, known pro known properties of drugs that we've. That we've got in a you know a database and so forth. So we train a kind of a collection of models for doing uh, you know protein binding or or chemical properties and so forth. So we've kind of got a collection of them that we a collection of predictors that can take a point in that reduced space and make predictions of, of you know things we're interested in for the drugs. That's super cool. And it is. You it, yeah. and, and the. You're you're doing this with it's a, it's backed by a grant and there's a grant. Yeah. Uh, and what so what's the what's the outcome? What's the the, the future outcome of, of this? Well, so the the um, uh, the company that I'm doing this work for is kind of in the business of providing um, uh, data and analytical support to, to uh, members of the uh, the drug industry. And um, so what they're going to do is turn this into a product where um, drug manufacturers can can um, uh, you know come to the, the who they, they sign up for a membership with this company and then they can uh, then they can come uh, you know run this machinery um, it, it use their own data as the input and train models on it and things like that and then and then use it as part of the uh, part of their drug discovery process got it is there any way we can relate this to vaccination and could you give us some insights on what what we're seeing? At least because we're all living this this world right now. Of I know, I know. With this vaccination, yeah. you have any thoughts about that? Um, well, you know, as as a human being, I do not professional thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, are, could this kind of application model be? Is it is it sim something similar to what they're running right now? Uh, you know, to kind of speed up the testing. Have they done something to to this extent using neural net uh, to find out like the different permutations or different uh, outputs uh, to a possible effective vaccination. So the 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 vaccination stuff is is not what I. So the the things I'm working on are what are called small molecules, and um, and the I mean they're the things that you take for um, uh, you, you know you have you have a uh, not for a virus so much, but more for um, uh, you have an infection, say a yeah. bacterial thing, and so then More you take it. Yeah, yeah, and so you take a you take. And the reason the the thing that's that's um, the critical thing with the small molecule is that you can pop it in your mouth, and right. and it and it's kind of small enough that it won't get broken down by the digestive process. While uh. you, whereas for things like a, a vaccine, you have to get a shot. Right, right. Exactly. And the reason for that is that, you know, it's it's a, a complicated biological molecule. And if you ate it, it would just get turned into, 
you know, fat or something. Yeah, or it gets thrown away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you would you'd lose the you'd lose the the, the properties of it that way. So the so the, these are for this is really for small drug discovery kind of stuff. Not and and it's more like cures after the fact than uh, mm -hmm. than viruses. Um, I I would not be surprised to find out that they'd use some uh, machine learning in uh, in coming up with the 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 you know some of the techniques that they're using now to fight the virus because some of them um, kind of start from a DNA the, a DNA strand and either right. either try and uh, you know make a uh, uh, you know figure out a way to get your body to produce the um, the proteins in the virus so that you can uh, use the uh, proteins that you've generated yourself to to kind of train for the uh, for the real thing when it comes along, yeah. and uh, and so it, it wouldn't surprise me that some of the steps in there have got some um, have got some machine learning in it, but I don't have firsthand knowledge of it. Yeah. So um, before when the dojo was open, I know you were focused more so on uh, machine learning uh, from a finance perspective. From oh, I'm still finance. doing that. Yeah, oh, and still still oh, look at this, yeah, man, yeah. man. Look at this. Yeah. Taking on the world with machine yeah. learning. Awesome, dude. <laughs> yeah. um, so what was the ramp up like for in, you know, how are you using the same kind of models I use today? What was the ramp up in moving into now from finance to drug discovery? What was that like? But mostly the the, um, the the problems are different. And um, and so they kind of require some different um, Different network architectures and so forth. Um, the most of the learning curve is around the um, uh, you know the kind of the domain specific stuff, uh, at which a lot of that has to do with the nature of the problem and 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 you know jargon that they use as part of the process. And and I'm not sure which is. Eh, I was going to say I'm not sure which is more complicated, finance or or biology in terms of in terms of the. The jargon, but that, but I'm you know the so I'm working with some people that are really very good at uh, at very good at chemistry and uh, and uh, uh, in in one case at least have got uh, a lot of experience with uh, with neural nets also and um, and and you know that's I kind of I kind of have to have that you know both for finance and for drug discovery just because it's it's not stuff that was you know, uh, that I you know have trained up on before. Got it. Got it. Cool. So um, I'm going to open it up, open the floor to any questions. I, I have all my questions, uh, but I want to give the audience, anyone else out there who uh, would like to um, ask Mike a question about his, his chat. And feel free to turn on a video. Um, you can, you can, you don't, there's no raising hands. It's not Zoom. It's Google Hangouts. You can just jump in. Uh, Nobody? I'll give it a little bit more of a second if you're, if you're coming together, so gathering your thoughts. Can um, you uh, can you say what company you work for? Uh, um, so the, the 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 drug discovery company is uh, called Collaborative Drug Discovery, and they're uh, I think they're up in well, <laughs> what the hell? Everybody's at home now, but <laughs> they've got it. They've got an office. They've got an office in San Bruno. And the finance company is uh, Susquehanna International Group in Philadelphia. Cool. I, and Mike, is, if anybody wanted to find out more information about this, where where, where would be a good start? Um, I guess I guess it would kind of depend on your uh, kind of depend on your background. The um, um, if you're if you're um, up to speed with the uh, with the neural nets, the you know you can go to ICML and find papers that have been published on on molecule design, and uh, the you know so that stuff's in the the archive literature. So the um, so if you know if you understand if you under if you understand um, you know a little bit of basic chemistry and some uh, and some uh, and some neural nets, you could get a pretty a pretty far ways into that. Is there a chat? Is there a, um, a chat channel here? Yeah, um, it should we be. Yeah, we have a we have a sidebar chat channel. Those who are uh, in the Google Hangout can see it. Uh, those who are seeing this um, 
Uh, later on, won't be able to. <laughs> they could join our Discord or our Slack. Well, that'll Slack just channel. be that'll just be there. I mean, you know, that's a motivation for them to be here in live. So show me where yeah, the exactly. where do I find the, uh, the chat thing? Oh, the I think chat should be it. upper right hand corner, little uh, yeah. comment box. Here's a, a paper. So that's cool. a um, uh, that's a uh, you know <laughs> it's fairly recent. <laughs> it, with this, yeah. it, do you review this in your machine learning uh, group? Is uh, this a, one of the topics? I have several of those. <laughs> okay. The um, the um, um, this one uses a, a really interesting a really interesting architecture, and. Um, the um, this one uses an architecture which called a flow network, and um, there's been some work that uh, there's not just some there's an enormous amount of work. It's sort of a it's sort of a fad. It's a uh, one of those uh, fads in uh, one of those fads in machine learning, which which happened. The um, the uh, and the, and the the idea is that if you take a um, if you take data with a distribution. You know, I, I envision this going kind of left to right. So we start on the left with some data, and we decide we want to map that into a, a different shape density. Then we can we can take little steps, you know, taking as layers in a neural network where we do just a small transformation at a time. And and if we make all of those invertible, then we can you know calculate the distribution on the on the um, at uh, at the output. And we can calculate the distribution and make it match an arbitrary distribution. And the other thing is that we can, that then we've got something that's easy to do a decoder on because this whole thing's invertible. So you just take the inverse and, uh, and, you, can, and you can run it backwards. And so some people are, have done that. This paper that I just put up has done that with, uh, with uh, drug molecules, which is a pretty remarkable thing. And um, I'm, I'm kind of enamored of that. And, and what we did, we, so we're not, well, we haven't yet covered this, uh, this drug paper in, the, uh, in the, the machine learning group. But what we have covered is a survey on these normalizing flows. There's a whole collection of tools like that. I've got interest in using it for time series stuff too, for the, for the, uh, for the finance stuff. And so, and so we've, uh, yeah. Very cool. Well, well, Mike, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for- My for pleasure, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. Stay on the show, speakers. Um, we, we have a, a very cool lineup coming in. Um, I've unpinned it and we have everybody in the room. We had some FaceTime with all the folks that have joined us today. Uh, but next up, we have also Lancy. I'm, I'm uh, just, I'm gonna, I, I have to say goodbye because I've got another meeting at 6.30, so. so oh, I just, oh, for, anyway, so, I, want, I want to explain my leaving is all, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely, no problem. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, but, my uh, pleasure. If you get, if anybody wants to catch Mike, he uh, catch him at uh, events at Hacker Dojo. Uh, he'll be available at his deep learning uh, discussions. Yeah, yeah. In chat. Right. You will see the um, you will see the link on the message group and also on the description on the meetup. I already attached the link to his LinkedIn. Um, so if anyone wants to reach out to Mike. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Okay. We'll see you guys. Thanks for the yeah. invite. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks, no. Bye bye. Yeah. So, Lancy. Hi, Lancy. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Lancy, there you go. I'm going to All right, Lancy, uh, you're up. Um, and there you go. Wait, are you pinned? I want to make sure you're pinned and uh, ready to go. There you go. So, uh, Lancy, uh, one of our members here, Full Stack Engineer, um, is now going to discuss uh, what the, the, it's a very interesting part. I, I mentioned it earlier today. It is the uh, how to reach financial peace in the midst of COVID. Uh, Lancy, thank you for joining us. Um, and I'll let you take it from here. Sounds good. Uh, let me uh, try this uh, Google Meet screen sharing. Um, let's see. Let me share a window. Let's see how this works. Um, this one. Can you guys see my um, screen? Yes, yes. Uh, for we the can. presentation? Okay, it cool. is present, yep. Sounds good. And, uh, oh, let me actually I have to unpin it. I'm sorry. I uh, need your presentation. There you go. Uh, cool. So you guys can see the green uh, slide. Yes, yes. I've I've pinned your slides. You're you're good to go. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Hi everybody. Um. Um. 
So a uh, long time no see. Uh, I um been a dojo member for two years, and then uh, starting from early uh, last year, um, it was um, yeah, uh, it has been a really great place. Just have this like uh, very um, uh, productive environment, and then I uh, have those like ergonomic desk. So I miss all of those things, and then uh, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So um. It's um yeah, and then uh, today I'm gonna share you know like uh, my uh, long term passion, which is financial peace. I um um basically um I basically uh, have been uh, like very passionate about this area. Um, and I have this like presentation entire one is one hour, but I saw Steph's um agenda, so I have around fifteen minutes. So I will try to uh, make sure I'm on track with time, so the next speaker will have enough time. Um, yeah, so um, for uh, financial peace, I, uh, I think it's really important because um, with COVID, there have been so many uh, uncertainties uh, just uh, um, in our economies. And then uh, back in March, we probably remember uh, multiple crashes in the stock market, which was really um, uh, uh, bad. And then uh, I personally felt this uh, anxiety um, and I really just like look at the big picture to think about how to uh, Feel this peace of mind, and then uh, I have put together uh, my uh, key learnings um, uh, in today's presentation. And then, uh, um, basically, also want to point out that uh, the knowledge here is 100% organic, which means uh, there's no like recommendation on any product, knowledge only. So a little bit about myself. I uh, grew up in China. I uh, then I came to the United States, um, um, and then um, I did my college and the graduate school on the East Coast, and then on the West Coast. And then uh, after that, uh, for the past decade, I've been uh, working in the high tech industry. Um, so it was a um, very rewarding experience. I learned a lot in the Silicon Valley, um, and then. Uh, Throughout time, I realized how important it, it is to um, basically be able to uh, improve my knowledge or personal finance. Uh, because uh, especially after getting married, I noticed that how much tax um, me and my husband have been paying is like a huge amount. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's, you know, what they say, uh, tax and death. These are the two things that we Guaranteed. cannot avoid in life. So, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so basically uh, uh, I realized it's important to continue to enrich my knowledge so that I can be able to uh, do asset allocation uh, for my own family and help you know people around me um, if uh, possible. And then uh, throughout the time I um, uh, obtained licenses in California, including real estate. I also uh, just continue to improve my knowledge. So one of my favorite mentors, his name is Dave Ramsey. So for those of you who do not know Dave, uh, he um, is a Christian leader in uh, um, uh, Tennessee. And then uh, he, um, for the past uh, almost uh, three decades, has been devoting himself to um, helping American families get out of debt. And uh, one of the key uh, uh, thing that Dave always like to uh, point out is that uh, um, this uh, personal finance, the majority of it is on behavior. Uh, which means no worry um, if you are uh, afraid that there's too much knowledge because it's really about improving our behavior and uh, we can all just, uh, we can all do it, yeah. <laughs> so on this slide, I, um, uh, based on uh, Dave's uh, curriculum of his Financial Peace University, as well as his uh, several bestseller um, books on Amazon, I uh, put together the steps to achieve financial peace. Um, so it's divided into um, the left half and the right half. So the left half is the basic steps and the right half is the advanced steps. Uh, note that uh, um, for the sake of time here, we are not going to talk about step six. Um, also for step four and five, um, they do not need to, um, uh, how do you say, take, uh, uh, basically they are, can take place in uh, parallel. Uh, without having to be a prerequisite to, to each other. So um, here, um, so this is the first step of, um, uh, this is the first step of this uh, um, 
like a financial piece. Um, and then in America, it has been for many, many uh, decades, uh, a ch common challenge um, of uh, having too much debt uh, as a country who uh, loves, people love to uh, consume. Um, and then uh, um, over here, I uh, point out, uh, summarize the top uh, consumer debt. So the highest one is actually a good debt is mortgage, which we will talk more later on in the presentation. So the second one is student loan, followed by credit card debt. It's pretty high, the number, after I look at the data, for example, for student loan debt, uh, in the recent year of uh, 2016, it was out, uh, already as high as uh, uh, 40 grand on average for a graduating class, which means it will take uh, at least uh, a few years for most people to pay off the debt, considering a large portion of the paycheck goes to Uncle Sam anyway. Um, as a result, we will ask ourselves, how can we be able to strategically uh, clean up our debt? As um, Dave um, um, pointed out in his uh, um, books, um, there's this uh, approach called uh, debt snowball. As you can visualize uh, um, the snowball getting bigger and bigger, so it's important to list all of uh, uh, a person's debt uh, in the, descending, uh, in the uh, uh, ascending order with the smallest first, and then uh, we uh, uh, try to uh, focus on getting rid of the smallest debt, get a sense of uh, confidence, and be able to tackle the next bigger one. And then uh, there are some other approaches um, uh, by um, some nonprofit companies, uh, and you can feel free to do some research over the internet. Uh, the next step is the uh, emergency fund. Uh, in a nutshell, it's basically a, a certain amount of cash that we keep in our saving account um, in case that there's a rainy day that hits. Uh, for example, in COVID, unfortunately, um, um, many people lost their job or temporarily are not able to have paycheck. Uh, but then uh, it's important to be able to feed the family, be able to pay the basic medical expenses. So the recommendation is to have three to six months household expense for the emergency fund. The, the step three is on cash flow. So um, cash flow is uh, usually, um, you know, like our monthly cash flow, it shows us how well or not so well our financial picture is. Um, it really can be boiled down to this uh, um, college uh, accounting 101 class uh, where we have uh, two formulas, the flow and the, the balance. So uh, looking at the flow, um, our monthly cash flow basically shows us if we have more income than expense, then we have saving on a monthly basis. Otherwise, it uh, uh, means that uh, we um, uh, getting, you know, like uh, short on our target. And then uh, um, when it comes to software, I am a tool oriented person myself. I like to use a combination of old school, um, like Excel, as well as, uh, uh, so that is for um, doing some kind of uh, basic uh, personal budgeting, as well as uh, to see how in reality we are you know, doing, uh, which is to use a tool such as Mint to track how we're doing. Um, also, uh, so for those of you who do not know Mint, it's a free um, uh, uh, online platform where you can connect to uh, a large number of your banks, uh, your mortgage companies, um, back on APIs and be able to uh, get real-time data on your transactions of the credit card companies. It's also helpful to check the red flag if there is any uh, credit card theft. And then uh, budgeting. The next uh, bullet point is about uh, um, having this kind of uh, um, habit, uh, having this kind of uh, uh, method to um, basically uh, plan for our spending of the money so that we can be able to reach both our short-term and the long-term goals. For example, over the short-term, if you live uh, pretty far from any public transportation and you have uh, are taking a long time to work, so you want to get a car, so you can have a plan to save a few hundred bucks per month, and it will take around a year to get a, uh, a second-hand car. Uh, and then uh, for retirement uh, budgeting, uh, according to Dave, he suggests us to save around like 15% per month. 
um, that's in a nutshell. So for retirement uh, um, planning, it's a, a very big topic. So we are not going to dive it into this uh, topic today. And then uh, the last one, some people would uh, be saying, um, okay, so I'm seeing that I have this um, uh, not a very ideal um, cash flow uh, on a monthly basis. I would like to uh, make more money. So nowadays a pretty popular way of doing that is the gig economy, such as DoorDash food delivery, which I'm using pretty often nowadays with COVID, Airbnb, et cetera. Now we are going into uh, the advanced half of our um, key, uh, steps to our financial piece. So um, step four, it's on a proper uh, protection. Uh, in America, we have so many, so too many sometimes uh, types of insurance. As a result, to uh, keep it simple, I grouped uh, them into uh, four buckets. The insurance are pretty uh, important and uh, uh, necessary for us because it protects us uh, in case something happens. So in bucket one is where we live and what we drive. So in case there's like a fire for the home, we uh, need to um, have home insurance. And the second one is health insurance. This one might uh, trigger lots of feelings uh, um, in, in you um, because in America, the system is just so complex when it comes to healthcare. So if you are a W2 employee, which means you have um, a company uh, and then uh, you've uh, been working for, um, and then that's such a blessing because your company take care of you by investing so much in your health insurance uh, providers' plans. Uh, so very thankful for them. But on the other hand, if you are a small uh, self-employer, like small business owner who is self-employed, on the 1099 tax form, then uh, it's really important to just uh, compare uh, all the available uh, insurance plan and figure out the best available one that fits both you and your family's needs. The next one is long-term care. That's for um, uh, people over age 60, like AKA senior citizens. Um, I um, didn't notice how um, uh, necessary it is um, until I read Dave Ramsey's book and then also some other websites data. So it says that Actually, the majority of Americans, um, 70% like nowadays, needs uh, long-term care. If you look further down the road, that number is very likely to increase because look at our social security is getting more and more depleted now with the retiring of baby boomers, etc. cetera. Uh, last but uh, um, not least is the life insurance. So um, life insurance uh, is uh, very important to uh, protect the families, especially uh, families with kids. And then uh, there is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, term insurance and the permanent insurance. The second type has not only the uh, insurance part as the first one, but also has the cash value part with certain type of uh, investment. Again, just like retirement planning, um, uh, life insurance is a big topic. So um, we are not going to dive into um, the details uh, of it today, but then uh, uh, there is the simple um, formula called DIME that you can take a picture or something um, for future reference on insurance need. This is the last step on uh, um, the advanced uh, step to financial piece for today. It's also my favorite one. It's called building wealth. Well, we um, uh, uh, started the process of protecting our families, and then we also think about how we can be able to be a wise um, investor, be able to, to build up our wealth. So over here, um, actually the wealth formula, um, it's pretty um, long lasting, uh, hasn't changed for the past many uh, decades, even centuries. Um, so money uh, increases as time goes on for the long term, it fluctuates, along with the interest rate in uh, the uh, financial market. And then uh, it uh, lose value together with inflation and uh, tax. Uh, for tax, I want to point out that it is easily the highest liability for a household in California because Uncle Sam, Sam and the IRS, they basically uh, calculate tax on the nation's basis, which means it's to the disadvantage of California in a way. And when it comes to the type of investment, 
Uh, I um, personally, I'm a big fan of real estate, so I like to uh, divide divide it into real estate and non-real estate. For real estate, um, it's really a good idea to hedge against inflation. If you look at the data for the past uh, um, uh, many decades, uh, uh, the value of uh, property has increased steadily uh, as time goes. Uh, in addition, uh, Uncle Sam gave us uh, good tax benefits for uh, both primary residents and investment properties. For primary um, residents uh, and investment property, both of them, we can deduct tax for mortgage interest. Also, if you have, um, uh, if you are going to um, selling your primary uh, residence, um, if it's over, um, you know, as long as you live there for over two years, as a single person, you can have a quarter million tax exam. And as a married couple, it's half a million dollar. And on the right hand for um, investment property, you also have additional tax incentives, uh, such as um, in the recent years with President Donald Trump, uh, who has real estate background, he has certain incentive called bonus depreciation. Feel free to research into um, it online and in the books. Um, and then uh, other uh, types will be in the financial market. Stocks is very volatile, as we can see uh, in the recent years. Um, mutual fund, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is basically a, a combination of stocks and bonds, depend on your risk tolerance level. Uh, last, I want to emphasize that the key to uh, investment on how is focused on the time rather than the timing. Because timing is speculation versus time means trustworthy. So this is just to illustrate if we have $1 million goal um, for our retirement, then uh, if we start saving as early as uh, in our 20s, we only need three digits versus if, oops, we did it much later um, in our 50s, then we have to save uh, five digits per month. Uh, this is just a rule of 17 to, to do a quick math on, uh, you know, like uh, the higher the rate of return is, the faster for the money to double. Okay, and here the table shows a recap of uh, the six key, uh, the key steps we talk about to financial peace today. I'm more than happy to have more in-depth discussion and uh, with you um, in the future because I'm very passionate for asset allocation to learn more about tax as time goes on. Um, uh, in fact, I also have uh, different education platforms I go to. One of my education platform recently uh, hosted an event on uh, how to preserve a family's wealth, on um, you know living trust, the difference between that and will, those things by a very um, experienced lawyer as well as CPA in this area. And feel free to connect with me on the LinkedIn. Also, have to connect on WeChat if you speak Chinese. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you, Lancy. Appreciate that. That was, that was awesome. Very cool. Very cool. And now, I, now all I have is uh, pleasure. I have these these. Uh, oh, let me see if you guys can see me. I have now all I got is dollar signs in my mind, right? Like they're just oh. <laughs> around, right? <laughs> um, some questions. Uh, anybody has a question? Uh, just being time sensitive, uh, we're going to keep this uh, series of questions a little bit tighter on time frame, so we can have a non uh, jump in. But uh, anyway, I have. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna limit to one question for me. Where do you think, <laughs> in particular, in the real estate market, Dojo is looking for a new real estate, uh, uh, new, 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 new uh, place, a new land? What are your thoughts? Uh, where do you think? We're, we're specifically looking at Mountain View. What do you think it's gonna look like in the next year? I know it's like asking uh, the, the the crystal ball, but what are, what are your thoughts on the the real estate market? Let's say, and it's commercial, so it's a little different than residential. But how do you, what's your thoughts about next year on the real estate? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so um, I um, definitely agree it's different uh, residential versus commercial. So for commercial real estate, I noticed recently there have been trends that you can lock in for, um, you know, half a year, as short as uh, even like a quarter or like uh, as long as the one year or even more uh, to get a very good rate. Um, so basically if you lock uh, the contract for, uh, you know, not have to be a long period of time, then you can get a pretty good rate. Um, so I think that's good, but it's good also to make sure the time is not too long, uh, yeah. just because we want the flexibility, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And remember you mentioned you want to buy? Yeah, we, we're, we're, the hope is that we, we can buy realistically uh -huh. 
um, 10 to 15,000 square feet for a hacker dojo to uh -huh. have all the cool things happening inside. Uh, we don't have that in our reserves, but we do have enough for mm. for, uh, for lease for now, unless uh, we, we do get uh, some magnificent, magnificent donors and philanthropists that mm -hmm. believe in our cause and our mission and love our community. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're just not there yet. Well, you're the expert of fundraising, yeah. <laughs> but I recommend <laughs> there's like a way, yeah. <laughs> there's a way in the residential real estate that you uh, rent first, and then uh, if you like it, you have a good uh, option of buying. So I think there oh, might be some similar option in commercial real estate, yeah. Oh That's yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, we, try that. Yeah, well, um, we 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 are for Hacker Dojo, the organization. We are we're actually looking to see if we can work with the city, actually, because mm. we're a nonprofit. For a community, so you know, at, at our core value, it's a community center, but it's tech focused, and uh, we're looking to work with the city. So I think that one of the best landlords to have would be the city uh, or a partner. That's a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> so Lance, uh, really quickly, I want to give the option for anyone to ask Lancey. Uh, we we have room for maybe just one question, and then we're going to bring in a non uh, a non. Anyway, that anybody, if uh, if you do have questions about this, I think this is highly interesting. I think this is important for everyone to, 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 to be aware of. You're probably already aware of some of this or, or just maybe there's something uh, specific about, you know, maybe mutual funds or the, the options. Feel free to ping, ping uh, Lancy um, for, for more details. She's very passionate. Lancy, again, thank you so much. Uh, oh, if you could un, un -pre stop presenting. I don't oh, have- Oh, yeah, any. sure. <laughs> and feel free to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, um, very happy to, uh, you know, like uh, communicate with, uh, connect with you uh, through, uh, you know, like communicate through the message or, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's a good cool. platform. Awesome. Um, cool. So next up, thank you, Lancy. And um, uh, thank yeah, you guys. feel yeah. free to, um, to, uh, to ping uh, Lancy. So now next up we have Anon. Anon, are you there? Hey, I'm here. Can you, can you hear me? How's it going? Pretty good. How about you? Good, good. We're we're holding up. Community's doing well. Cool. Awesome, so, uh, you know, we're we're running a little bit behind. So, but I just want to we're gonna jump right into it, being sensitive to all the speakers' times. Uh, I'm I'm gonna let you take the floor and, and take it from here and and tell us a little bit more about the art of selling without selling. Sounds like some really good selling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, let's do it. So, how many of you are business owners or entrepreneurs over here? I would say yes, me. Yes. So, so we all know, I mean, I'm seeing the dollar signs behind you. We all know that sales is the lifeline of your business, right? I mean, without sales, you can't, you can't generate the cash flow. Yet when you use the word sales or salesman or whatever, what's the first thing that comes to mind, right? Usually people don't want to say the word. They're like, is this like a used car salesman? That's the typical stereotypical image. And in this day and age, how do you stand out, stand out from that, right? How, what, what can you do to sell without being salesy? And that's, that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And that's my core belief and uh, a little bit about me. My background is in marketing. I've worked in marketing for the last eight years in corporate marketing, uh, including some big companies in this area, the San Jose area. And um, about a year ago, I went full-time and I started my own marketing agency. And we focus on video marketing, which is how do you use videos to market yourself in a way that you no longer have to sell to your audience, like your target audience and the tribe that you build is gonna come to you. So if I can just go and, uh, I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. Oh, sure, sure, sure. You absolutely can. Awesome. There you go. I'll All right. All right, so this is my presentation, The Art of Selling Without Selling. And what I mean by that is like these, I'm sure you recognize most of the faces in this slide. And these are people who run some of the biggest companies in the world. But the thing is, all of them have something common, which is in, in the world of marketing, we call it a personal brand, which is you, you don't just follow the company, but you, you know the person behind the company. And the reason for this is it creates some, it's known as a celebrity authority effect. And you don't have to be like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or, or of that level to be able to create this for your particular industry or your particular niche. 
And if you can become a, a go-to celebrity in your niche, that a person that people really look up to, that that means that you are pretty much gonna completely dominate your market. Like other people might try other marketing t- tactics and sales, but they won't be able to come close to you if you are able to create this kind of celebrity authority effect. Because at the end of the day, people buy from people. Uh, in this in this world of social media, I mean, there's so many ways you can reach your customer, right? There's you can use like Facebook and LinkedIn and uh, you know Snapchat, TikTok, all these Instagram, all these networks, right? So what can you do to create that effect? Like there's so many options, marketing outlets out there. And, you know, the reason why we focus so much on video content is outside of meeting uh, people in person, video is the second best option when it comes to communication because that's, it's like an audio visual form of communication. And that's how people connect with people. They see who the person is on the video. They see, uh, you know, what they're like, how they talk, whether they have similar values. So it's a very powerful platform, especially with uh, things like COVID and the lockdown. You can really use the power of online video to spread your message and connect with people, not just one-on-one, but like one to many. And most people, they don't really want to buy, but I mean, people, sorry, people want to buy, but they don't want to be sold to. And that's where the... Well, that's why people are reluctant when it comes to the word sales or salesman or salesperson. Like they don't want to talk to a salesperson, even though they might want to buy. But when you have a powerful personal brand, your customers will actually come to you and want to buy from you because they see you as a leader. And uh, most of us buy things to solve a problem or to overcome some sort of pain in our lives. And if you can be that person who can provide the solution, be the person who is the, the, the person who provides the, you know, solves problems for your community, then people will be naturally drawn to you. Now, you know, in, if I'm sure you recognize these four characters, right? Harry Potter, Frodo, uh, Neo, and Luke Skywalker. These are all like blockbuster movies and these are all popular heroes in movies. But what do all of these four characters have in common outside of you know being in big movies does anyone want to take a guess oh let me unmute Um, they're male true (laughs) they're young they're hip yeah yeah they're underdogs yes Uh, i like that word underdogs so in, in the concept of like storytelling or in look at any, these are just four examples, but look at any, almost any story in history, mythology, they all follow a particular format. And this is known as the hero's journey. Uh, has anyone heard of this, the hero's journey? Mm-hmm. So if, if you want, there's a good book on this topic uh, by Joseph Campbell, if you want to check it out. Just look up Joseph Campbell. You, you'll find, uh, I think it's called A Hero with a Thousand Faces. But this is a classic story that we all have heard in some shape or form. But one thing that all these heroes have in common in all stories is that they have like a mentor figure in, the, in their story that enters the story. So even though these heroes are underdogs, usually in the story, uh, they come across a mentor figure that shows them the way. So, you know, in Star Wars, you have Obi-Wan Kenobi. In uh, mm-hmm. Harry Potter, you have Dumbledore. In The Matrix, you have Morpheus. And you have Gandalf in, in The Lord of the Rings. So what if you could position yourself as a mentor, mentor figure in your industry? And, um, and the biggest mistake that most brands make is they, they think that they are the hero. And most brands just talk about themselves. Oh, you know, we were founded in this year and we achieved this and this is what we do. But no one cares about that. So if you can find a way to make your customer your hero and you be the mentor in the story, that that is a game changer. And there's a really good book on this topic. I learned this from a book called Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller, meaning how can you put your customer through their hero's journey? And, uh, you know, that's what we talk about when it comes to like marketing and specifically using videos to, create, you know, do effective storytelling, but also focus on your customer's story. Like, what is it that your 
customers want. So who is my hero? Or, you know, where are they in their life? You know, what keeps them up at night? And what are some of the villains that they want to defeat? Like each story needs to also have a villain, right? So what are some villains that they want to overcome in their life? And how can you help them as a mentor overcome those villains? So one way is to that mistake that most people do is they just talk about how good we are. But in most cases, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't want to talk about yourself. You want to put your customer in a story. And what most businesses do, and this is known uh, as the larger market formula. Again, I got this from a book called The Ultimate Sales Machine. And most businesses only focus on the 3% of the customers that are ready to buy right now. Like they know they, they want this and they're ready to buy right now. But what they miss out on is they miss out on the 17% of the people who are in information gathering mode. They miss out on the 20% people who are problem aware. And they also miss out on the 60% of the people that are not problem aware. And you can do all this if you're consistently creating content and you're consistently um, you know, teaching people that may not be ready to buy right now, but through your content and if you make them aware of the issues and how you can help them in this situation, then that is a game changer. And that's why content and specifically video content is super powerful this, these days. And since most businesses are only targeting these people, you have this huge market for you available out there. So the platform that we recommend and even with our agency is YouTube, of course, because it's the largest video platform. It's got 2 billion active logged in users and it's the third largest, third most visited website in the world today. Um, YouTube is also the second largest search engine in the world and it's owned by the largest search engine in the world, which is Google. So most people are going to a platform like YouTube because they're looking to solve a particular problem and they're looking for how to videos like how to do this right so if you can find a niche you know and see what what people are searching for i mean you can just go to your youtube search bar type in how to and you're going to see all the results that come up and what youtube is suggesting you and these are things that people search for so when most people think of search engine they think of google or maybe bing or yahoo but youtube is larger than all the other search engines combined so it's a very powerful platform for you to be able to get discovered by your ideal audience. And yeah, 73% of US adults use YouTube, which is even more than more than Facebook. And each visitor spends an, on average 11 minutes and 24 seconds on YouTube per day. So there's a huge engagement. People stay on platform and they typically watch 6.5 videos on average. Like if you've ever, watch YouTube, you know how good their algorithm is at, at suggesting you the exact video that you need to watch right now. They know exactly what to show you to keep you watching because the more time you spend on their website, the more ads they can show you. So that's their business model. But if you can create content that keeps people on the platform, which is engaging, doesn't have to be super fancy, you know, super uh, crazy cameras, even, but if you can master things like really understanding your customers' problems, storytelling, then that's really gonna keep people engaged. They're gonna connect with you. And if you help YouTube keep people on the platform, they're gonna in, in turn promote you as well. And yeah, it has a very powerful search and discovery algorithm, which is people either search for stuff or they get suggested videos because YouTube also knows what you are looking for based on your search history, based on what channels you follow or based on what kind of videos you already watch. And then YouTube videos are also easily shareable across most social media platforms. So you can take, take your YouTube link, you can share it anywhere. You can share it in Facebook groups, you can email it out, you can embed YouTube videos on any website. So it's a very versatile platform in that way. And YouTube videos are also easy to repurpose. And what I mean is if you produce one video, you can even natively upload the same video onto platforms like Facebook and LinkedIn. Like you don't even have to resize them. It's the same format. If you want to resize them, you can make square videos for Instagram or vertical videos for IGTV or make short clips for TikTok. Literally all these social media platforms today are all heavily video based because that's just how people are connecting. And 
the difference between social media networks and YouTube is that YouTube is the content on YouTube is evergreen, meaning that unlike other social media platforms, like where your content is pretty much gone in 24 hours um, and it's gone in the feed, YouTube is more of a library where you can store all your videos. And if you opt if you optimize your videos for particular keywords, then your content has the potential to get discovered for a really long time. Like let's say even five years down the line, you made a really good video. And if it's still relevant, people are still gonna be able to find your video. So you don't have to keep pumping out a video every single day. You just create a really good topics around your niche, uh, help people, educate people. If you wanna make an offer to them to check out your website, or if you wanna promote anything, it's it's a very powerful platform and it's it's like, an evergreen source of traffic for you. And then finally, YouTube is also a very powerful advertising platform. And most people don't realize this, but if you know how to run YouTube ads and you do this through Google ad, you know, the Google ad platform itself, but you can reach, uh, you can advertise your videos to the exact audience that, that you want. There's so many options. You can target by keywords, you can target by you can place ads on other channels and kind of almost like steal uh, people from your competition. So it's a very effective platform and it's very cost effective as well. So yeah, that's my presentation. You know, this is my company and this is what we do full time. Uh, my company is called Vid Growth. And I also have a meetup group. I We haven't hosted any events, but we have a meetup group called Silicon Valley Growth Marketing. <laughs> If you want to look up but after seeing uh, you know presenting to you guys i'm like i can do this virtually i don't have to wait for uh things to open up so if you guys are interested in any virtual events just where i'm going to teach different concepts about like sales and marketing and uh you know finding your ideal audience uh, communication then uh, feel free to do that um i also have my own youtube channel which is just my name anand j so that's my last initial so if you just search Anand J on YouTube, you'll find it. Um, and if you want to request a video for me, and if it's a good topic, I'll actually make a video on my channel for you. So yeah, any questions? That was awesome. Thank you, Anand. Appreciate it. Much, much cool. Very cool. Uh, so Anand, I, I do have one question. I, I have one question. Um, and I'll open the floor out to 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 others. So um, let's say, uh, I so where does one start in gathering, making people aware, because that's content is king, con uh, context is important, and uh, capturing those eyeballs are very hard, right? And mm -hmm. if 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 someone is getting some, like let's say I'm I'm going into gaming, and mm -hmm. there's these Twitch stars that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I'm pretty good, but you know, let's just I'm just pure example. What is it? Is it in the for for YouTube growth or? To capture those eyeballs because it's really hard in that very beginning right mm -hmm. to get your first thousand viewers unless it's something and we know the form we know the super bowl formulas right like cats dogs babies uh something funny something falling it, the over the edge stuff that that's kind of easy right but what if it's something not so easy and how well just getting not not the the end all formula but what's a good way for for someone to get started in generating uh, viewers for video, for their video library that they're creating now. They're like 10 videos in. Right, so when you mentioned those mainstream topics, right, cats and Super Bowl, it's actually, yeah. it might be harder. So if you can get more specific, uh -huh. you know, so for, for example, um, if you talk about like one of the biggest niches is fitness. But if you just make regular fitness videos, it's not really gonna stick with people. But yeah. if you get specific in terms of Maybe you teach men over 40 who want to lose weight mm -hmm. or, you know, people who, who don't have access to a gym, like very specific kind of audience. It's still a very big audience and you can dominate that niche, become their mentor in that niche. Uh, it's it's yeah. not that hard to do. So it, it comes down to clarity. Who, like we've got to ask, like, who is your audience? Who, what? what, uh, why, when, and where, right? If you can answer who is this person, where they're from, what do they want, why do they want to achieve this, and how I can help them solve their problems in their niche, then it is, um, it's very effective. So yeah, I mean, take some time to get clear about your niche. That's what I found. And 
when you type in stuff into the YouTube search bar, yeah, you know, yeah. let's say you you type a thing on, you know, how to. I'm just using the fitness example, like how to build muscle, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a very broad topic, like. But then you're gonna see a lot of results that YouTube is suggesting, which are known as long tail keywords. It's the SEO term. You know, you have short tail keywords, which is like how to lose weight, how to build muscle. But you have long tail keywords, like how to build muscle without going to the gym or how to build muscle uh, on a vegan diet. Mm -hmm. Got so it. Yeah. That, you know, if you go more long tail initially and ca really capture that market, it's still a very, very big market, but you don't have to go mainstream. So, and, so you don't necessarily need to write a long story <laughs> in your description. Maybe keep it very short. Is it maybe like SEO kind of optimization within the engine? Like how, what's, what's the hack around these? So the unfortunately YouTube is not very easy to hack the algorithm. You know, people, yeah. there's some things you can do. I'll, I'll give you some tips and practically speaking, you got to think like YouTube. YouTube's goal is to keep people on the platform for as long as possible. So if your video keeps people on the platform, meaning first of all, the topic is something interesting, right? So you got to really be clear uh, what the person wants because you can make a really fancy video, but if people don't care about that topic, they won't click on it. So be clear about your audience and the topic, number one. Number two is be good at communication. And what I mean is you don't need like fancy equipment. Your cell phone is pretty good to get started. Um, you don't need fancy editing, but if your story, if your message is connecting with people, it's gonna, it's, it's known as watch time. That's the number one metric YouTube looks at is how much watch time is your video accumulating? So if your video is able to accumulate a lot of watch time, and if your competitor's video, like they're not watching it that much, even though it might be the same topic, you are gonna outrank them. And number three is known as your click-through rate, which is if if YouTube shows your video to 100 people, how many people actually click on it? It's a percentage. So that comes down to how good your thumbnail is mm. and uh, explaining the value and creating intrigue and hooking people and, and your title. So it's a combo of your thumbnail and title. And it comes back to like basic copywriting headline formulas, you know, like almost like they call it clickbait these days. I mean, but if you're delivering, then it, it's not really clickbait. Yeah. But you have to, how do you stand out, right? It's YouTube is like a whole marketplace of videos. What can you do to stand out? So if you, if you select the right topics, if you are engaging and keep people watching your videos. And if you have a high click through rate, let's say at least 5% click through rate, mm -hmm. that's that's really good. So, you know, the more people click on it, the more watch time it accumulates and the more they'll start showing your video to people because they're like, oh, this video is getting off quick. Right, got it. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to go and hack the YouTubes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, I'll rank it. It, it. It's a challenge and it takes time. I, I could imagine, you know, it, so if it's your watch time, I could imagine you probably need a lot of content, right? Like maybe uh, it's worth it to create a thousand videos in your library so that YouTube will say, okay, cool. This, this, this uh, content creator, um, this th content creator will, has a lot of content to show. Let's start pushing them up in the search. So that makes sense. Well, I, I'm clear on that. Um, Absolutely. And I would, say, I would yeah. say a lot of people are paralyzed by, you know, I, I'm not good enough. I, you know, I sound funny, whatever. It, it's everyone goes through this. And I recommend all my clients um, or people who I even just do basic consultation with. And I'm like, just make a hundred bad videos. <laughs> That's your goal. Yeah, because yeah. chances are by the time you get to your hundred video, it, it, it won't be bad. Yeah. It's just practice. You just get so good at things. Right. But don't, don't be afraid to have some bad videos. You're going to look back at your first video and laugh uh, in the future. That's what I did. Um, oh. But I'm like, wow, you know, I've come a long way. So it's, it's. I feel making videos is like the ultimate form of personal development because mm -hmm. it teaches you so much about communication and not worrying about other, what other people think and rejection. It helps you overcome so many things. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, you, and you're, you're connecting with people. Do you think it's it's so in in some of those those challenges in some of those challenges do you see that maybe um, live can be something hindering or helpful? Um, it's not accessible at the time you mentioned. It's not it's not always accessible because you'll have a catalog later. But how does live feeding into that? Does or does it even do? Do you need to worry about that? Uh, are you saying like live streaming? 
Yeah, yeah, we're live, right? Yeah, live streaming, exactly. And it's so, taken, it's taken over, right? It's getting it's a hot thing, right? It's it's become more, more popular. Yeah, it's very powerful, but you gotta understand that you need an audience first. So if you don't have an audience, then no one's gonna watch the live stream anyway. Yeah, so if yeah. you're in the if you're in the growth phase, then I would say make more content or unsearchable videos. But if you once you have an audience, then you shift more to content which is community based content, which is your live streams and all that kind of stuff. And then you also have a third category of content, which is more like conversion based, as they call it, like more sales based content where you know you, you know that video is not gonna perform in terms of getting more people, but it's gonna if you wanna make an offer and you wanna make a video announcement about it from time to time, it's okay because you you build an audience and then you decide how you wanna monetize and Literally every every business does this, right? Like look at Facebook. They spend years building their audience and then they, they're monetizing it. Or YouTube, you know, they, they offer value and then they monetize it. So with your channel, you're doing the same thing. You're building an audience and then you're making an offer. Not everyone's gonna buy from you, of course, but that's fine. You know, whoever is uh, one more thing I wanna mention is there's an essay online everyone should read. It's called A Thousand True Fans. Mm -hmm. It's by this guy named Kevin Kelly, a thousand true fans. And most people think I need millions of followers and whatnot to have a successful business. You only need a thousand hardcore fans that will, and you know, let's say those thousand fans spend a hundred dollars with you in an entire year in some way, you just made a six figure income. So it's not, you know, it's not like that out of reach and anyone, anyone can build a small tribe of a thousand people. If you give it like a solid year, just you know, really give value to your audience. You can easily attract a thousand people. Oh, that was good to know. Good right. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, right. Ken, you have a question. Yes, um, I'd like to build the brand, my brand, a little bit. And I'm looking at other tools. I'm using Camtasia right now for screencast. Is that a, a top of the line? Is that what you would recommend for screencasting? Yeah, I've heard. Uh, there's another one called Ecam. Uh, do you have a Mac? I no, yeah, I have a um, Windows. Uh, okay. Acam, I think, was a little lower down than Camtasia. Camtasia, I think, cost more. But uh, right, I, I, I thought, or maybe Ecamm something different, different company. Who knows? No, Camtasia is good. Camtasia also got a really, really good editor, video editor, right? So it's uh, a yeah. really beginner friendly. It's not too complicated, and um, it's it's also got a screen uh, screen capture, so which is pretty good. So yeah, yeah, I. I, I, I I really don't like those videos where the guy goes, oh, what's up, man? And I ha and he has his camera in this crummy room that, you know, needs to be cleaned up. And yeah, I'd rather have a nice screen cast that, you, you know, that's more professional. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you show your face, though? Or no, is it just the screen? It's just the screen to show what I want to do. Okay. And, you might uh, want to show your face a little bit, either like in a corner or maybe in the big intro, just make an introduction so people get to know who the person is. Uh, I've seen okay, a lot exactly. of channels like they only make screen capture videos or they only make animated videos, and they're good mm -hmm. content. But people don't really connect with people. Like, you know, it's it's almost okay. like, you know, how we're connecting, right? You can see my face, I can see your face. So, if you want to just make an introductory video, like in the beginning, like first ten seconds, hey, it's Ken. I make videos on this, and then go back into the screen capture. So just it's like a one-on-one -on -one introduction almost. Okay. I think I that kind of felt I was, too, I kind of felt I was too old, so that's why I kind of stayed away from that. Oh, no, no, no. There's, there's no such thing, you know. I I follow so many channels on YouTube that are uh, slightly older people, and these guys are crushing it. Like one guy that comes to mind, even even my dad is a fan of him. He's uh, this guy named Scotty Kilmer who makes car videos, over three okay. million subscribers. He probably makes a million dollars a year. Uh, okay. Incredible, you know. He edits all his own videos. And you know he's very funny. So if you guys want to get a good laugh, or if you think you're buying a car, just check out Scotty Kilmer. He's amazing. Like no nonsense. He's a car mechanic, and yeah, okay. he's amazing. yeah. Okay, I mean I, I can sound younger. I don't. I really don't sound like some old guy. But you know, any, and the other thing I wanted to ask about is uh, if I want to write something on the board, uh, what's a good tool for that? Is there something called Pan? I know there's OneNote, but I need to get something to attach to my computer so I can do a lecture like show write something down or show a diagram or something like that right it's a good so, tool for that right uh there's there's a few tools if you're just doing a screen capture you can just well, open any well, document no. and 
No, 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 that's not that's not it. I'm trying to uh, have a tool attached to my computer where I can have a, some pens and write on them like red, green, blue pens and say and do a diagram of like you know maybe some boxes or something like that. Okay. Or show um, some lines here, and I'm at this box, then I go over here, then I go back to here. And... I think he does it right uh, in his his interviews. Uh, yes, uh, that's recording absolutely. practice, right? He does that. Yeah, that's oh, yeah, exactly Ed, what I want to do. That, that okay. Ed, Ed hit the nail on the head. It is exactly what I want to do. But he does it all the time. Yeah, I mean, he's writing here. He's writing some code. And here's how we're going to, you know, here's this note. You're looking for kind of an interactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And he's talking he's over here and over there. And uh, that's what I want to do. I have do. a I question, um, Anand. So yeah. uh, we talk about two types of platforms. One is YouTube, which is a recorded mm -hmm. video. The other one mm -hmm. is real-time meetup, like over here. Have you compared the effectiveness of these two uh, channel of communication? Uh, for your can business? you see the second one? Yeah, Meetup versus YouTube. Oh, Meetup versus YouTube. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, just to answer Ken's question, uh, if mm -hmm. you have a Mac, there's yeah. a there's a feature where you can connect your Mac to your iPad, and it's called like a, they call it like a sidecar. So you can okay. use your Mac, I mean, sorry, your iPad to draw stuff while your computer is still on. Uh, on Windows, uh, there's one channel I watch that uses something. I think it's called like just a, a whiteboard. Um, um, I'll post it. I'll send it to Stephanie or I'll post it. Um, I, I, the name slips from my mind, but there's a software you can just use. It's a free whiteboard kind of software. And you can draw stuff uh, and okay. stuff like that. Is, was there something called Pen or something like that? You, you, but I need a, I need the whole tablet where I write on it and stuff. That's what I need. I'm, I have Windows 10 here, a regular old Windows 10. And do you, have dot screen? What, do you have touch uh, screen? Do you have touch screen on your Windows? Okay. No, no. I, I need something that I can plug into a USB port, and, and then there I go. I have a tablet to use. And I'm wondering. Right. This, okay. Uh, I, I know you can do that on a Mac for sure. You, you, it's called a sidecar okay. feature. You can attach your oh, iPad. Yeah. Sidecar. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, for I, Windows, I'm not sure. Maybe I should go out and buy one. I don't know. Or maybe <laughs> Google, maybe Google like a sidecar tablet sidecar for Windows. Maybe there's a way you can do it. Okay. But I, I have a Windows too. But I have a my Windows is touch screen, so I can actually draw as well. Mine's a two in one. It's like a hybrid. It's a tablet and laptop. So yeah, I, I, I can. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe yeah, I so I can do that on mine. Uh, but you may you may need like a sidecar, or uh, if you want to, okay. if you're planning on buying a Mac then on an iPad, then that 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 would be worth that would be worth I'll it. Probably, I mean, probably buy a Windows thing, maybe like you have you have a new Windows whatever with a, a tablet on it. Then maybe that's yeah, it's a, it's a it's a two in one. Uh, is it the Microsoft Surface if you're looking at Windows? Uh, I think the best one right now is probably like the Dell XPS. I've heard good oh. reviews. Uh, I have an HP Spectre 360. Gosh. HP, okay. yeah, but I've heard no, good things about the Dell. Okay, all right. Cool. It just seems awesome. like you know, if you're gonna make if you're gonna make a video, you don't want to get typecast as somebody who's a lousy video, or you know, I mean, you just don't want to make a crummy video. You don't want to do that. That's why I'm asking about the best tools. And you, you also to want cool effects, all right? <laughs> yeah. So if anybody wants to know what I'm using right now, I've been changing. When you first came into the meeting, I was a little baby. And uh, now I have I wild hair. And look, at it. yeah. I, I'm, it's complete AR. Um, I'm wow. actually using uh, <laughs> Snap Camera. <laughs> it's an app, and you can run it while um, while you're in Google Hangouts. So yeah, <laughs> if anybody it, wanted to see it, um, yeah, I've been having fun with it. I don't know if anybody's been noticing, but I've been having a lot of fun the whole uh, meeting with it. <laughs> I've been noticing. I've noticed. Yeah, all of them. They're yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. This is. Awesome. I think I could use some of the hair. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of filters on here. Um, cool. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, I think what we're gonna do just to keep time sensitive, uh, for for the programming and stuff. Um, so usually at this point we say thanks for coming and that's it. That's that's kind of where we are today in the uh, COVID world where we have these really cool hangouts and then. There's no way to connect afterwards. We're not, the, the show's not over. No, what we're gonna do, we have actually been experimenting with this. A couple of members are familiar with this, but there's this thing called icebreaker video. And what it does, it is uh, you you will randomize, randomly get partnered with someone for two to three minutes in this chat. 
and we're all going to uh, be doing it. So um, I have to go grab some food. I have not eaten. I, I had an early lunch and no dinner. Um, but Steph, Steph's here. Uh, Steph is going to be uh, running it. We're going to still keep this running. Um, this, uh, uh, Steph, are you there? Oh, sorry. I was on mute. <laughs> sorry. Can you guys hear me now? Hello? Yes, yes. I can oh. hear you. Okay. So, um, so what happened is I will send you guys a link and the link calls ibreaker dot video is will send it will send you to a um it's like a room chat and then what happened is um let me just go ahead and send you guys that link right now. All right, yeah. So, let's let's set up that link and then so here's the only thing, it's conversion, click through. Uh everybody's in here right now. Uh, but what what we're hoping right now is that everybody is going to go and click on this link for icebreaker video. If there's any other questions uh, for any of the speakers, uh, Mike already stepped out, uh, but does anybody here uh, have any other questions? Yes. Yeah, one more. For, for you, Ed. Oh. Actually, I have a, just a question in general about the meeting. Can you guys hear me? Sure, yeah. yeah. Hi. Great. Okay, sorry. I kind of joined late, and so I missed the earlier talks. Uh, I see on the top of the screen it says it's recording. Do you guys make a recording of this meeting? Yes. yes. Yes, oh, we will okay. this on our YouTube channel at Hacker Dojo. Oh, great. Okay, that was my question. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, awesome. and then um, you mentioned I, I uh, did send a little comment when you guys were talking about the thousand true fans. And that's like uh, an idea that's, that's, I guess it's uh, almost 10 years old or more now. And mm -hmm. the concept is, as you said, if you can get a, hundred, a thousand people to pay you a hundred dollars a year, you know, mm -hmm. that you can make a pretty good income. The new concept now is that if you can find 100 true fans, that will pay you $1,000. So it mm -hmm. changes the way you think about things because you really have to move from people just supporting you mm -hmm. to actually providing content and value that people really, really want to pay for. But oh, that's yeah. kind of a, a new way to look at it as well. Oh, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the, the link, it's actually from Andreessen Horowitz, and the link is in the, the comments. Excellent. Thank you, Jody. Thank no you. Problem. Cool. Quick question. How, how did you find out about the, our lightning talks? Just mind you. Oh, um, I'm a Hacker Dojo member. Uh, well, I was in the past, and obviously I pay attention to everything you guys do. Cool. And oh, unfortunately, cool. I haven't, well, no one's been going out much, and I'm just getting stir crazy. And yeah. I restarted uh, my own, I have my own meetups, the informal Android developer meetup, and the informal iPhone developer meetup. Actually, okay. I used to have them uh, at the Hacker Dojo long, long, long ago. Ah. When it was over at Wishman Road. Wishman, yeah, 140. Yeah, anyway, so um, they, I've, I've recently restarted them online, but I wasn't sure how that would work. So I actually went over to to your events page, because I figure you guys might be doing some online stuff, and I want to get an idea of how how to make online meetings work, especially mm -hmm. in kind of an unstructured, informal manner. Right, so, right. So, anyway. yeah, uh, so there's there's this one we call the icebreaker.video. I think it's really cool. It's kind of like a cleaner version of chat roulette, <laughs> but you have these little cards that you can answer to break the ice and stuff. Uh, it's kind of cool. We've been using it. We've been trying to use that um, just kind of where you know, you have these online meetings, but it, at the dojo, the cool part was after the talks, right? Like you get to do a one-on-one, -on -one, get to go talk yeah. and chat it up with one of the speakers, or you have two different entrepreneurs or one tech enthusiast, one or developer, and then an entrepreneur. And then after a couple of beers, there's a startup like over the weekend now going, getting built, right? So that's kind of the cool things happening. We're trying to capture that same magic on virtual, very, very challenging. Yeah. Right. People are zoomed out, and we just want to make it cool and, and something where people can can feel like they're hanging out, a little laid back. At your own level, at your level, that can you can build it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But thank you, thank you for joining. And uh, if you would like to share your link for your um, your meetup, please feel free to do so in the chat for others. Oh, uh, sure. Are there any mobile programmers in in the bunch? Uh. I well, I am. I, I I develop in Swift. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I am, as well. Yeah, we're a couple. Okay. Awesome. I will send the links. Very cool. And what we'll do, Steph, um, when we post this to YouTube, all the links and referrals to books, uh, I think that would be yeah. really cool for us to to put that in the description. 
just so people have a, a little note, you know, uh, uh, some information during the talk, if they weren't able to see it in the chat, uh, right. we'll have that information available on the YouTube. And um, hopefully uh, it'll help someone out. To a non-talk, that's Ed, why it's so important to have something like the dojo where we can build our videos at a place like the dojo where we can yeah. physically go down there and have our cameras going and things like that. That's that's one of the real wins. And that might be something you'd need to think about Wednesday. We'll talk about Wednesday or whatever. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. For those who, who are interested in knowing, um, Hacker Dojo will be having its advisory committee meeting next Wednesday. It's an open forum for, you don't have to be a member, but someone who's interested in helping continue the conversation about our rebuilding. Right now, Hacker Dojo is closed, unfortunately. But I think us putting community first is important. Uh, we've closed down, we've terminated the lease at, at the location 3350 uh, Thomas Road. But guess what? That in, is allowing us to start thinking about the new. Um, and that's what Ken was mentioning. We have these monthly meetings with members and non-members and just the community overall to discuss how do we move forward? And um, we have some updates, it'll be cool. Uh, but that's that's definitely on our, our priority list. As soon as Santa Clara County, they recently released a tiered um, uh, business safety operation recommendation and uh, graph. Once it gets down to yellow, I've already talked to the board. It absolutely makes sense for us to start thinking about and discussing and negotiate and engage uh, brokers and others who will help us open a new location. When is that going to happen? I'm hedging February, March ish, the way it went from purple to red and then orange and then it has to go down to yellow and the way it changes every 30 days. So that's kind of our guess. It's and definitely hit up Steph. Um, uh, she's our community manager. Uh, you can join our Discord channel. That's the open community channel. Steph, if you can, um, definitely share that in the YouTube video, our Discord channel, where it's open to anyone and everyone. Uh, it's, it's a place where uh, non-members and members can talk and discuss. Um, so I see a couple folks have joined the icebreaker uh, dot video. If those who would like to join more, to jump into icebreaker, we're gonna cut off this recording. Uh, I hope the viewers, you enjoyed this. Definitely check out hackerdojo.com. Hacker uh, we will be concluding this review, but thank you for joining.